All right, welcome back. Uh, I'm Gary from Refinish Media. David, as always, is behind the camera. We're in beautiful Ann Arbor, Michigan right now. Today, we got a pretty important guest, uh, Larry Webster. We're going to talk about his background and where he's from and who he works for a little bit later in the segment, probably more in the medium, uh, medium part of it. Uh, in case you guys don't know, and comment down below if you actually have read some of Larry's work before. Larry is a legend in the world of print and media and automotive. We're blessed to have him today. I know he's not going to agree with this on, on me because he's a humble guy, but I've known Larry for over 20 years. He's worked for a lot of the big magazines. He's really well known. He's really, really, really well respected in our industry. And I want to get his take on some key things that are going on in the automotive industry in 2024 and beyond. But before we get into that, as always, I always want to ask everybody right off the bat is your very first car. What was the year, make, and model of your very first car? It's so easy. Nin <laughs> uh, and it's going to be embarrassing. It was a 1984 Dodge Daytona Turbo Z. And it wasn't just a turbo. The Z was important because it got you this whole new round of body work on the bottom. And if you remember, they did the two-tone. Yep. It was red up top, silver on the bottom. Yep. And it had embossed Turbo Z in the back bumper. And it talked to you, and you could hear the turbo go. Shh. Why that car? Uh, my dad had one, and uh, he crashed it. And and uh, luckily, this was kind of funny because he would commute to New York City. I grew up in New Jersey, and he had this car. We both loved it, loved the color. And since um, New York City instituted a seatbelt law, mm -hmm. and he was going by the tolls, he had to wear a seatbelt. Otherwise, he never did. And he was on his way to work one morning. Somebody came across the center line, and and. Uh, he had a head-on crash. Wow. And he survived. He was fine. The car was toast. But if it wasn't for that seatbelt law, he'd be dead. Yeah. Yeah. Cars were not as safe, you know, then as they no. are now by a lot No airbags, yeah. no nothing. But it was just that, you know, I don't like regulation. I don't want to be uh, told what I can do, what I can't do. But in this instance, I was like, eh, yeah, thank goodness. Yeah. But that was a great car. So then after that was totaled, I looked and I found another one. It's forty one hundred bucks. Cut yeah. a lot of lawns for that thing. <laughs> <laughs> what color was the first one? It was red. It was red. both. It was both. yeah. It was red. We found yeah. kind of the same one. Was it a manual or it was, an auto? Dude, of course. Okay. Right. You know, yeah. never know kids these days. You and know? <laughs> uh, I, I was doing like burnouts with it. I'm like, I didn't know you could do front wheel drive burnouts. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and then I burned the clutch out, and that was a big controversy. Couldn't have the money to replace it, but I kept that car for. Uh, until about the middle of college, and then uh, I got rid of it because I realized. Um, as much as I still love the design, it, it was a K car, yeah. piece of junk. Yeah, it really was. And, well, most yeah. cars in the '80s were junk, though. I mean, yeah, it's. I always get people who say, uh, "Yeah, my car would outperform most performance cars from the '80s," and I go, "Performance cars from the '80s? Like, what are we talking about? The Grand National? Like, yeah. what perform? What American performance cars came in the '80s? Don't say Corvette. I love Corvette, but don't say Corvette. It was 150 horsepower. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't yeah. even intercooled. Yeah. I mean, it was like the worst of the worst, but. I just loved it. Uh, I, it was so many things I learned with that car, and you'll laugh at this. I didn't, you know, back then in the '80s when I was in high school, I was very hands-on focused. You know, I had dirt bikes I would fix. I was fixing all the neighbors' lawn blowers and snow blowers. I had a business cutting grass, and but I was good at math, and it was very clear you weren't supposed to take the shop classes. Yes. And the guidance counselor was very; they wouldn't let me take auto shop. Yeah. But the best I they would say. You should take, uh, I really wanted to do this. So they said, okay, take wood shop. So yeah. that's what I took all through high school. I just loved it. So I didn't know some basic things about cars. My dad didn't know. He wasn't hands-on. So I was just fumbling around. And I, I really remember it had these really cool uh, aluminum wheels with, with uh, holes around the circumference. Yeah. And it was like a shiny yeah. finish. And I got this spray bottle to, to clean it, you know, because the brake dust. And I sprayed it on there. And, and it was horror, like yeah. the finish melting off yeah. the wheel. And I was like, what? It's probably acid. Well, I don't know what it was. <laughs> it just killed it. I was like. Oh, I wish I had known that, you know, before I, you know, cause I couldn't afford to replace it. So that yeah. was it. So that was like, you know, a lot of those really painful lessons I had with that car. So now I know I'm like, I don't the, trust the cool wheel thing about stuff like that is like, you know, that is a lesson you'll never forget. I never I mean, forget think it. about how many years ago that was. Yeah. And you're still like, Oh, don't do that. Don't but do that. Know what you're spraying on a finish. And, yeah. and then, I mean, that's the way people learn, yeah. you know? You can't watch. We didn't have YouTube back then to look things up. Well, I would have loved YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. I always tell, like, the younger generation and stuff, I go, you know, you guys are asking all these questions and stuff, and, you know, you can't figure it out. I mean, I came from a generation where we had to figure it out. We didn't have YouTube, and they look at me like I'm like I'm kidding. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it was funny because the way I got my first uh, motorcycle 
was via a moped. Do you remember the mopeds? Oh, yeah, yeah. They were, and a spree. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Is that a moped? It not have pedals. Yeah. That's a scooter. Oh, yeah, that was a scooter, yeah. I guess. We call them mopeds. Yeah, so a guy yeah. down the street had one, and it was a, a, a piece of junk. It yeah. didn't run. Yeah. And uh, I was able to buy it for 20 bucks. And I brought it home, and my mom was freaking out. And I was like, look, Mom, it doesn't run. Don't, yeah. don't worry about it, you know? And, of course, I, I start just connecting wires and screwing around. I got it running. Yeah. And a week later, the cops pulled me over somewhere and dragged yeah. it home and mom lost her mind. But I mean, that was the sort of ethos was like, nobody was going to do it for you. Yeah. And what was the harm in figuring it out and just goofing around and maybe you got some success. I don't even know what I did right to make it run, but I know I got it running and it, some that of my, was it. Some of my best memories were driving motorcycles and four wheelers and working oh, on yeah. them and, yeah. you know, buying junk and, and cleaning them up and yeah. fix them. And I mean, that's where I first, you know, gained love to, you know, Honda four wheelers and motorcycles oh, and stuff yeah. because they seemed, in my opinion, better than the rest of them. Yeah. But they were more expensive. Sure. You know, in case anyone's noticed yet, uh, Larry Webster is not the only guest in the studio today. We have <laughs> a, a couple uh, stray cats that we uh, took in uh, and take care of and stuff. And usually they don't want any part of us down here. What's her name? But uh, her name is Boots. Boots. And, uh, what a great name. So for whatever reason, she's chewing on the tripods. Uh, she jumping loves in my Larry lap. jumping in the lap. She yeah. was on the table. And you know what? We're just going to go with it. She's happy. We're happy. So that's Boots. And she has a twin sister that looks just like nice her. Nice cat. All right. So here, here's the question of the day. that I Well, one of the questions of the day is I want to know – your thoughts on, you know, we call them EVs for the people who are not down with the lingo, uh, electric vehicles sure. versus like everyone says ICE, which is internal combustion engine. Mm. I, oh, I, I hate you. that yeah. stuff. But what's your thoughts on like the EV, where it's at, where it's going in general? Yeah, I mean, um, I think about this a lot. You know, I work at Haggerty and uh, one of our taglines is Never Stop Driving. And I started a weekly newsletter called Never Stop Driving. It goes out every Friday. You can get it at the com slash newsletters. Uh, it's free. And the whole point was to sort of keep a scorecard of what's happening, not just the EV world, but the autonomous vehicle world. Because you remember it was like six years ago, seven years ago, even Bob Lutz came out and said, you know, by 2030, you won't be allowed to drive. Yeah. And we all freaked out. Yeah. Technology, as we know, is they overpromised. Yeah. You know, it's going to be way behind. But the EV stuff's really fascinating because it's suddenly really polarizing. And I think that's because um, people feel like it's being forced on them. Yeah. And um, I'm more open to it. I've driven some EVs. They're fantastic. Yeah. And um, I have no problem with a turbo engine, a gas engine, a diesel engine, or an electric motor to propulse the thing. So yeah. I don't really have an issue. There's a lot of ways that the, I think the technology is um, helpful. I, have, I, um, I love dirt bikes like you do. Always yeah. had them. I bought an electric dirt bike a couple of years ago. Yeah. I ride that thing more than anything. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Nobody knows where I am. I go where, anywhere I want, you know? I, it's funny you brought it up. It's it's funny, like, the EV thing. Like, you know, me personally, it's like, it's your money, it's your car, drive whatever the hell you yeah. want. I personally don't like EVs. Uh, I'm not saying What that. have you I, driven? Uh, I've driven the Lightning. I've driven a couple Teslas okay. and stuff. I, I don't hate them. Yeah. Uh, you know, the things that I don't like about them is that, like, with a truck is they don't have the range. They can't pull anything, Oh, really. sure. Yeah. You know, no, and, not, and again, yeah. I, I don't hate them, but I, I'm a little old school. Like, I don't even like- It doesn't my, fit your use case. My, 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 my daily driver right now is an automatic. Because yeah. like even like most modern vehicles that you buy, every everything is an automatic. Everything's an automatic, and I actually would prefer to have a six speed manual. Hmm. And everyone laughs at me like, "Why would you want to shift daily drive?" I just enjoy that about older sure. cars or whatever. Yeah. And and maybe I'll I'll change with age or whatever. And I you know one of the things that scares me, and maybe you can uh, talk about this, is what about like the lack of range and the fires that they've been having with some of these EVs? And yeah. then, and this is just stuff that we hear on the news. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, oh, they won't charge in Chicago because it's too cold. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's new technology. Yeah. So there's, there's stumbling blocks. I mean, the way um, we're looking at it is we're in the middle of the biggest transformation in automobiles um, since it started 100 years ago. And I know you're a student of history and you remember back in the turn of the century, the 20th century, 1900s. You know, they had electric cars. Yeah. They didn't know what fuel they were going to use. Yeah. Right? And and there was a lot of stumbling blocks. You remember, like, uh, I can't remember if it was England or here. They used to have somebody walking in front of the car with a flag because they were afraid it was going to mow somebody over. Yeah. So 
I, th- I think we're in a lot of those growing pains, and they did overpromise a little bit, and the yeah. infrastructure didn't keep up because a lot of use cases, the the pickup truck EV, I don't get it all for the reasons you just mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Like, how are you going to tow with that thing? Yeah. I mean, but you and I also know they sell what eight hundred thousand F one fifties a year. How many tow? Ten percent, twenty percent, very very few. few. Yeah. So you know, it, it's just um, it's a matter of what you like. The 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 thing I think with electric is it does offer much greater flexibility in where you get the energy. Yeah. You know, is the fantasy that all of it's generated in a renewable way? Yeah. Well, who wouldn't want that? The, the problem, I think, is that often it's looked at as transportation is the uh, the big cause for too much CO2 in the atmosphere. Yeah. And if you, you look at where all the greenhouse gases come from, like 30% of it, I just was watching the other day, is from uh, um, food production. Yeah. So there's like a lot of contributors to this. Somehow the easy or, you know, the fantasy fix is the transportation sector. And I think that's where a lot of the rub is. Instead of it as this like, hey, here's this new technology that'll make your experience or it'll make you get more out of your car. It's more like, uh, well, you have to do this. And yeah. I think people are revolting. Yeah. I, and, and again, like I... I I think there's a place for for electric vehicles and even autonomous vehicles. Hundred percent, yeah. And and I I do think that I speak for a lot of people. And, and you guys can comment down below what you think about the future of EV. Are you for EV? Are you against EV? Is the internal combustion engine better than EV? So let us know in the comments down below what your thoughts are. But I mean, I me personally, I just didn't like how it felt like the government yeah, was, yeah. you know. And, and I think most people think that they lied to us. Shocker. Yeah. All governments lie to their people and they kind of forced it in it. And I think EV will continue to grow, but the there's going to be no cars in 2030 and, you know, you can't buy gas. And I, I don't buy that at all. Not not in my lifetime. Yeah. I don't think people will do it. I it, it, OK, <laughs> so we could talk about the uh, autonomous vehicles. There was one this past week I just wrote about in my newsletter. Uh, it was a, a Waymo vehicle in San Francisco. Yeah. And uh, San Francisco. You know, it's the home of the tech industry, but that city is really struggling with the AVs. And it was, you know, they were had this movement where people were putting traffic cones on the cruise automotive uh, autonomous cars to stop them because wow. they put a traffic cone on the hood, thing just stops. And they're mad that they think these these things are clogging up the roads. And um, so a week ago, they set fire to a Waymo autonomous vehicle, burned it to the ground. That's crazy. And the way I look at it, I the way I think about autonomous vehicles is, yeah, there, there's going to be accidents. For sure, nothing's perfect, yeah. but I think about the, the 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 test I use. So let's say my kids are in San Francisco, they're out late. It's ten, eleven, twelve o'clock at night on Friday, and they're walking the streets. And there's traffic right next to them buzzing by. Do I want a robot driver or do I want a human? I want the robot. Yeah, because the humans they they might be drunk. They might be looking at their phone. All kinds of things that humans do that are dumb. So, do people really text and drive? <laughs> <laughs> is that is that a thing? <laughs> I don't use voice. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I think the technology is really being misaligned, and I think maybe some of that was overpromised. Larry Burns just did an interview with Automotive News. Larry Burns was the chief uh, technologist at GM for a long time, and he's now saying like the promise that we were going to buy a car. And you get in it like the Jetsons, read yeah. your paper and press a button and it takes you where you want. He's like, that's probably not realistic. It'll probably be like really good autopilot. Yeah. And have you used any of these systems, the automatic cruise control? Have you used any of those? Yeah, a little bit. I, I kind of like yeah, them. Yeah, they're, they're okay. Because highway know. driving to me is not driving. Yeah. Commuting's not driving. It's yeah. different than when I want to go out for a drive, which I do. So yeah. I see room for it all. I don't feel like it's a zero sum game. Yeah. My my driving experience, it, it, I like the driving because I get so amped up, especially after work, is that half an hour drive. It, it, it it's a decompression. Me down. Yeah, it, it does yeah, for me. I hear and that too. and yeah. I, I love I love that aspect of it. And I and I miss it with the shifting of the of the manual gears. Yeah. And like, you know, when I built my last hot rod, everyone goes, Oh, you should put an automatic and it'd be faster or a paddle shifter, which, which they're right. Yeah. No. And and I, I kept having this argument over and over with people. I'm like, listen, you can tell me whatever you want. You're wasting your time. I will never, ever, ever put a automatic in that car. I'm mm. not saying, you know, I'll never own an automatic, but I'm never putting an automatic in that car. It's going to be a four or five or six speed. Yeah. I talked to a guy a couple of days ago. I did an interview with him. Um, he, he started a company called Sacrilege Motors in Connecticut. And he is uh, retrofitting Porsche, air-cooled Porsche 911s with wow. an electric powertrain. And 
on top of that, he goes through the entire car. This is over half a million dollars when yeah. it comes out the door. And he says, look, this thing is like, we totally re-engineered it for more torque. We figured out how to charge it. And he says, you get about 200 miles in range. Nobody drives these things longer than that anyway. Yeah. His argument was really interesting because, you know, the air-cooled 911 engine is it's a lot of character. Yeah. It's like, why? It's one of the reasons you like the car. Yeah. And I haven't driven it yet. I hope to this this uh, summer. He's like, it's a totally different experience. He's like, it's it's different, way more fun. You got instant torque. And he, he was, I don't know if I buy this argument, but he's like, in 30 years, who's going to fix a 1969 911 and its mechanical fuel injection system? I don't buy it either. You don't buy that? Yeah, okay. I don't buy you it. I mean, maybe, it. He know, <laughs> maybe he knows more than we do, but I, I don't buy that either. I think I think there's always going to be car guys around or car girls around. Yeah, I think so, too. And, I mean, you know, there's like – They're still fixing Duesenbergs. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I know when I was coming up, uh, you know, I was – an old car to me was 60s, 70s. That was old. Like, even the 50s cars were a little bit too old for yeah. me. But as I get older, you know, now I'm looking at pre-World War II cars and I'm like, oh, those are cool. And, and I think as you get older, yeah. I think that, you know, your taste changes sure. or, or 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 your range changes a little bit. You know, not everyone. Okay, let me throw this argument at you because yeah. um, uh, maybe it was like f- four years ago, somebody came and uh, on the Haggerty staff said they, it's the 50-year anniversary of the Clean Air Act. Mm-hmm. And that was, you know, the EPA was new in the early 70s. That was a Nixon thing. Yeah. And the Clean Air Act uh, was a response to the smog in California that was so thick it would make your eyes burn. Yeah. And uh, I said, okay, um, you know, we're about automotive joy. We want to, you know, make people feel good. It's like that's kind of a downer subject. So could yeah. we shift the, the tone to say, like, there was a painful decade in there, but at the end, what did that get us? That got us the electronic systems that enabled the 700 horsepower yeah. uh, Challenger absolutely. out of the absolutely right yeah absolutely. So there's this transition period that kind of stinks. Yeah. And but you end up getting it to the next place, and I think we're in that 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 kind of painful transition time. Yeah. And I also know a lot of the top people at these car companies; they're all car folks. Yeah. They're every bit as absolutely. passionate as we are. So I don't feel pessimistic about it. So I mean I know that this is a complicated question and uh, I'm not looking for a simple yes or no but yeah. but the you know the federal government and you know the average non-car guy on the street is positive that EVs are are better for the environment than the old internal combustion engines without a doubt EVs you know they they their production uh you know the disposing of the batteries later in life. That you know, there's nothing wrong there. But we know the enemy is the gasoline cars. I mean, do you buy that? Do you think that there's? It's too complicated. I'm too dumb to answer. <laughs> I, I do. I will tell you though. I just had somebody uh, write something for us that'll be in the Haggerty Drivers Club magazine, where he, he kind of says that, where he says like, "Wait, when did it not?" become environmentally conscious to recycle old cars because you didn't have to build another one. <laughs> I just yeah. thought, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll eat the letters on this one because it's it, the life cycle analysis is, I think, really hard. Yeah, uh, I, I think we don't have enough information on it. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, again, I, not to be a conspiracy theorist, I don't buy everything that they tell us. Yeah, but again, I think we're in that transitional time. Yes. You know, I've heard folks from General Motors tell me that, okay, yeah, we get it, but in five years there won't be any of these precious metals in the batteries. I'm like, okay, do I do I know if that's true? Yeah. No. Does it sound good? Yeah. But I also know that there's so many smart people working on it. Like you've been at these car companies. Yeah. Do you remember that guy that came and um came to your shop and was doing the he came from Ford. He was working on that Ford GT that you made out of the Taurus. The yeah. wiring guy? Yeah, yeah. He's a uh, smart guy. Yeah. G- genius. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's just there's, there's a ton tons of them of in those there. Guys. Yeah. So I feel like I feel more uh, like I said, optimistic about what they're gonna do. It's funny because like uh, a lot of like if you work in a mechanic shop or yeah. a body shop or whatever, you hate engineers and you think that they're stupid because this bolt is here or whatever. And, it's hard and, to get and, to, and, that, and yeah. they just that's accepted as as you know the gospel. But then and, and don't get me wrong, there's some dumb engineers out there. There's dumb people everywhere. But in my experience, most of the engineers that I came through and, and I've had experience with were brilliant people. Yeah, yeah. You know, very nice, brilliant people, car people. Yeah. You know, and like I thought I knew a lot about cars. And then I come across some of these guys and I'm like, wow, these guys probably forgot more about cars than I'll ever know. <laughs> okay. Can I tell you something else that might uh, make you a little more optimistic? I just wrote about this too. 
So um, I love motorsports, you know, all kinds. Of, this weekend, NASCAR, NASCAR, NASCAR. rained this, out. This weekend's supposed to be the <laughs> Daytona uh, 500, but it got rained out yeah. today. But I like uh, road racing as well, and the 24 Hours of Daytona was in um, January, and that's IMSA, yep. International Motorsport Association. This is what is amazing. So you remember the car companies used to be involved in that pretty heavily, yeah. and then they left. Yeah. And you think, well, okay, I get it. Uh, road racing doesn't really speak to customers. This doesn't really work for them. At this year's race, Gary, there were 17 car manufacturers involved. That's awesome. 17. And then I thought, okay, this must be cheaper than NASCAR. No. The top level, it's double what yeah. a season in NASCAR costs. And NASCAR, we know, gets huge ratings comparatively. Yeah. So I haven't gotten a good answer yet, but I'm looking into it. Like, what are they getting out of this? So clearly they're seeing people love driving, people are passionate about cars, and this sort of motorsports is a way to establish their bona fides. So... The opposite has happened, what everybody said. Everybody said it would be driving toasters. <laughs> but the opposite is happening. Yeah. And so I feel like all that stuff, the people we know, there's nothing but to be really optimistic. Yeah. Here's the last electric car question today, sure. I promise. Yeah. Besides, what kind of electric car do you own right now? No, just I just got my dirt bike. Yeah. Uh, you think they'll ever be collectible, electric cars? They already know, are. You know, they already are. Yeah, but- yeah. We do that bull market list uh, yeah. where every year we call it the bull market list. We highlight... 10 cars that we think uh, have hit the bottom of the depreciation curve or they might start appreciating. And this was always about, uh, you know, people think it's expensive to be in the car hobby. But what we're saying is, no, no, actually, you can buy these cars and then you could enjoy it for a couple of years, sell it and get about what you paid. I mean, that's awesome. And we put a Tesla Roadster on the list because we thought those had bottomed out. And for that use case, I don't know if you've ever driven one. They are super fun. I've not drove the road. Super duper fun. And now, which is really interesting, the original ones uh, you can retrofit with the latest battery and the range, because they don't weigh anything, the range is insane. Four or 500 miles is what I'm hearing. Is that the one that uh, Elon uh, launched into space? Is That's that one of you launched into space, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully one day we'll have so enough yes, money uh, where we can I do, do that. think they'll be collectible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you agree? Uh, yeah, I think everything's collectible. Yeah, I mean, people yeah. collect video games. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Remember it's Beanie Babies? If those things are collectible, anything <laughs> is. I mean, come on. Uh, but, uh, you know. I well, mean, that's what I saw on the shelf over there, all your yeah. Beanie Babies. Oh, I, no, they're in the <laughs> attic safe in, in their little protective <laughs> glass cases and stuff. All right. Uh, so here's here's more personal questions Shoot. is uh, how and why did you get into cars? You talked a little oh. bit about dirt bikes and stuff like that. Yeah. But what was, you know, what was the, I the don't jump know. that got you into that? Couldn't tell you. Yeah. I mean, it's like, do you like chocolate? Yeah. yeah. Do you like cars? Love them. Why? I don't know. They always spoke to me. It's always been uh, ever uh, since a young kid. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I can remember in the uh, road trips with the family sitting in the back of the station wagon, and I could ID cars by the taillights. Awesome. And I knew them all, and it was just, it's always just been the way it is. So I've just, it's never, you know, you a lot of interest come and go. Yeah. But cars have been a maintaining, and I'm so grateful for it too because like. I, you know, a few people have such a strong passion. Absolutely. And it, it, very few have it. Yeah. And so that I've got this thing, I'm like, oh, this is, well, yeah. I, I feel lucky. When we when we go to parties and stuff like that, you know, my, my girlfriend is not into cars. Yeah. She drives a Mercedes, though. Yeah. And th- she likes cars. But I meet her friends, and they want to talk about politics or religion or travel. And, you know, I can do that for a minute. Right. Boring. I don't care. <laughs> if we're not talking about, like, cars, boats, motorcycles, sure. something with a motor in it, like, I'm out. Like, I, you know, I got you got about five minutes with me. Yeah, <laughs> okay, but think about this. I'm 53, and, um, you know, when I think about my – well, I'm working on a car, and I call it adult Lego. Yeah. And when I get it back together, or I take the engine out, and I put it back in, and it starts. Yep. Or – I'm looking forward to putting it back together. Like, and I get this like childlike excitement. And I think like, does everybody get that? And I don't think they do. Yeah, no, they don't. They don't. Okay. It, it's funny because uh, we build cars from the ground up, and, yeah. I, and I call it the battle of the thirds. Oh yeah. And and you know you built a lot of cars on your own in your garage, so you probably experienced something like this. When I get a new project, mm-hmm. that first third of it, oh, oh my god, it's the best, best ever. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna buy all these parts and I'm gonna yeah. do all this, and then you're the middle third. I, why do I do this? This car sucks. Never again. I hate my life. This yeah. is the last one. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna junk it. Yeah. And then you get to the bottom third, like once it gets out of paint, let's say. Yeah. And or it fires up for the first time. Like right. I always say, like you know, when we're building a car from the ground up, 
you got to make paint because it's going to change the whole attitude in the shop. And then oh. when that car fires for the first time and they hear that V8 roar, yeah. is it changes the attitude. And yeah. then you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. It's it's that middle third that usually kills everybody. Yeah. They can't push through it. <laughs> it is a tough spot. I mean, um, I've had different – I don't build a lot of cars, and it's usually – it's like – it's not on the level you're doing. It's like I'll get a car. Let's say that Mustang I had, and yeah. you know, I might take the motor out and do the clutch or – you know, simple stuff like that. So I get Pull it. A, the motor, simple stuff, people. You hear? No, just kidding. Well, <laughs> compared to like building it from scratch and doing all that stuff, I think it's pretty yeah. simple. So, I I um I get so excited because these cars they enable for me so much fun. Yeah. Like I think about the experience of driving them, which I love. You know, I race cars, I drive cars. I just the the feeling like I'm. We wrote a book about it called Never Stop Driving. I am fascinated by this idea when I'm on the racetrack. I'm wearing a 3,000-pound suit, metal wow. suit, right? Wow. And everybody else is around me. Yeah. And we're, we're barreling into this turn, and I can tell what that other driver is going to do based on the vehicular body language. And, I, and our brains can do that. And then we can only carry our body at, let's say, 15 miles an hour running as fast as we can. Yet, we can go over 100, and that data stream coming into our body, we can intake, we can process, and act on it. Yeah. I just find that... Um, like we're built to go fast. I think that's why a lot of the youth loves video games because it's oh. simple and, and they get that shot of dopamine. Yeah. But if they ever got into the car world or raced or, or I mean, even go karts. Like if yeah. you can't afford cars or you're too young to drive a car. Yeah. If you look on the internet, there's some place within a hundred miles that yeah. has go karts that go if you even forty miles an hour. Yeah. If you drive a go kart that goes forty miles that's an hour fast. around a track. It, it's a different experience. Yeah. And it will really get you into it. Yeah. So we had this guy write about it. And, and uh, you know, humans have always been sort of infatuated with speed. You know, if it was early Hawaiians uh, surfing or if people were skiing, it's sort of like this extrasensory uh, mode that we have as humans, which I find it's maybe perhaps it's a mystery I don't think I'll ever solve, but why it does feel so satisfying to us. Yeah. And then the next thing I tell my kids, I'm like, uh, now I got a couple sons that are racing with me and I encourage them to go into motorsports or something. Cause you're around that industry and nobody's there. Cause it's a job. Yeah. They love it. Yeah. And I always think like, you know, I've been in jobs, you've been in jobs where it's a job and you need a job. You got to yeah. make money. But boy, if you can somehow combine it so you really are passionate about it, I mean, that is a really lucky way to live your life. Absolutely. That's why uh, next year after the we stop doing this podcast, I'm going to become a NASCAR racer. <laughs> I finally, just talking here, I finally figured it out. I found my calling in life. I mean, obviously, you could have been a mechanic. You could have been a body man. You could have been a fabricator. There's yeah. a lot of things you could have did in the automotive world. Sure. I mean, you obviously can do the hands-on stuff, and you prove it with your projects. Why media? How did you get into that? Oh, it was a total it? lark. I mean, I studied mechanical engineering, you know, in high school, uh, like I said, back in the 80s, and they steered you away from shop class, which um, I'm still bitter <laughs> yeah. about. Yeah. Um, but uh, they said, well, you're really good at math and you love cars and, and stuff like that. So you go to be go to engineering school. And I thought, this would be great. I'll design cars. I yeah. hated it. Yeah. I mean, I knew I had to stay in it because I had uh, student loans and an engineer got a good salary out of college. Yeah. Pretty simple. And I did that. And then a couple of years as an engineer in D.C., I was just miserable. And I don't know where the idea come from, Gary, but I'm glad it did. I thought, well, I really like these car magazines. Maybe I could go work at one. Yeah. And um, I'm oversimplifying how hard it was to get a job at Car and Driver. That's what brought me to Ann Arbor. But I was just putting gas in cars and washing them. Yeah. And I was 25 years old, yeah. five bucks an hour. Yeah, I was nothing. paying off my car with a credit card, yeah. living with college students. My whole family thought I was, they were- They thought you were crazy. You crazy. Know? Yeah. They really did. And then it just luckily it worked out. Yeah. That's good for you. Was yeah. uh, What was your uh, first uh, uh, magazine that you worked for? Your car first, Driver. Car Driver right yeah. there in Ann Arbor? So I came out, I did whatever they wanted, and I made myself useful. I couldn't write for beans and uh, just was like, what do I got to do? Yeah. And it worked out. So how long ago was that? That was 1995. 1995, Almost wow. 30 years. Awesome. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> so w would you say print is dead? I, I, no, 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 no. Um, yeah. In fact, it's coming back because, uh, you know, at Haggerty, we're in all mediums. We have 3 million subscribers to our YouTube channel. We've got 5 million followers on our social. Wow. Our website gets about a million and a half unique visitors a month to read all of our stuff. And then we have this magazine that's bundled in with the Hegarty Drivers Club, and that goes to 800,000 people. Wow. And um, 
it also brings in the most revenue from an advertising perspective. And what's happening is that in all this noise, and you know all the noise, yeah. what we think is that there's a segment of the population that grew up getting their automotive enthusiasm from print, and there's some nostalgia for that. Yeah. And then the other thing is it's a, it's a lean-back curated experience that has a shelf life. It's not so disposable. So people are Drivers Club members. We ask them, why are you a member? You get roadside assistance. You get a magazine. You get discounts. You get access to the Haggerty Evaluation Tools, a bunch of other stuff. The top two reasons they, they re-up is the magazine or roadside. Wow. So it's, that's good. it's just a model that's working for us. Yeah. I think I saw it when the owner of the company called me 10 years ago. I saw – I was at Road & Track at the time, and I was like, yeah, this isn't really – I don't see a future for this, but I saw in this bundle a way to keep it going. And thank God it's working. Yeah. So you worked for Car and Driver, Road and Track, and then you worked for Popular Mechanics. Popular Mechanics, mechanics yeah, I did that yeah. for a little and bit. Haggerty. So those are all those four are... big hit, hidden companies in the automotive world. Yeah, yeah. Before you leave, I should uh, show you my collection. Uh, you know, I grew up reading Hot Rod Magazine oh, I love and Hot Car Rod. Craft. Yeah. And I mean, in uh I've got automotive magazines dating back to, I don't know, 1940s, 1950s. Yeah. But, I mean, I have thousands and thousands and thousands of them. I mean, some that I haven't even read yet because I don't get around to it. So they mean something to you. Yeah, they do. I mean, yeah. my dad actually uh, bought a lot, uh, like a whole collection. And then he was like, I'm not moving them. I'm not hauling them. You store them. So yeah. I've lugged them to a couple different houses oh, and locations and stuff like that. <laughs> we hear but, that a lot. Yeah. And, it, you know, but I mean, it's it's kind of cool because it's a piece of automotive history. And I've yeah. always been a reader and I've always been yeah. into cars and into history and stuff. So it's kind of. The trick is, though, you, you, the business model has to support enough production budget to do it well. Yeah. And that means hiring talented people. Yeah. And that means hiring talented magazine people, design people, photographers and writers. And it all comes down to that. I don't know if uh readers say they come up a lot and they say we really like the magazine. And you'll say why and they'll say something like well, you know, I like reading Jay Leno's column because yeah. Jay Leno's in it. I'm like, yeah. okay. See a car guy? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and Jay by the way, he's not afraid of the future either. Um <laughs> So uh, I think that if we if we produce it in a high quality way, they may not be able to verbalize why they like it, but they'll leave feeling like it was a good spend of time. Yeah. And you know a lot of magazines you read that were done sort of not at that level, and you just are like, yeah, whatever, it's disposable. Yeah. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. You mentioned uh, when you first started at Car and Driver, you know, you were test driving, putting gas in cars. I, yeah. I imagine you got to drive a lot of I cool did. cars. Yeah. What's some of the cool cars that like stand out that were you know really surprised you from those days? I mean, um, the most the one that's sticking out right now is the first Viper. Um, I remember driving that, and I was an inexperienced driver. It had a lot of horsepower. And a lot of bump steer. Yeah. And it was going down the road nowhere near straight. And I thought, how do they sell this thing? <laughs> Who's going to drive this thing? So that that really sticks out. But that was at the time when, um, you know, horsepower was coming back. You had, um, uh, it was the era of the tuners. Yeah. Do you remember the Lingenfelters? Yeah. Oh, I thought and, you, when you said tuner, I thought you meant the JDM tuners. I'm sorry. No, no. It was this big, Rentec was making stuff. And, uh, in order to prove that the car was of a sufficient quality, we would top speed test these things. So we would go to this big oval in Ohio called Transportation Research Center. It's now owned by Honda. Okay. It's got a seven-mile oval. Wow. And um, I can remember Chuck Mallett brought this Corvette up, and I said, okay, we'll you know, substand a, a, a top speed run. He's like, absolutely. So we go there. I don't know how old I was, 26, 27. And suddenly I'm going 202 miles an hour around this oval. Wow. And the, the the that car wasn't built for that speed. The yeah. windows pop out. Yeah. And it's all kinds of noise and it's all over the place. And I remember thinking like, this is really dumb. Because <laughs> 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 you know, Mario Andretti could he could correct if something happens. Yeah. If something happens, I'm I'm Pe done. I'm dead. Don't, people don't realize like if you're going 70 miles an hour and you go 80 miles an hour, yeah. like that 10 mile an hour doesn't oh. feel like that big of a difference. Yeah. But when you're going 180 versus 190 versus 200, those 10 yeah. mile an hour, it's it's a big difference. It's yeah. a huge difference. Well, the amount of kinetic energy is is uh, it's a square of the speed. Yeah. So every little bit of speed, the total amount of energy goes up, you know, hugely. So. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, that was really fun. Um, we drove some stuff. The uh, the thing that really blew my mind was an NSX, the first Ferrari F three fifty five. Wow, which just sounded incredible. Yeah. Um, and you know, we really got into driving cars 
in curvy roads. We'd go down to Ohio. So there was a lot of fun around doing stuff like that. And it was just a vibrant time because, you know, the car manufacturers are still very into sporty cars. The first Miata, you know, I still own two of those damn things. I yeah, love them. They're too just... tall, though, the Miata. You must race it with the top off. No, you get the first gen, the hit, the hit point's low enough, okay. and, and we hollow out the floor and stuff okay. like that. There's gonna, ways around it. I was going to say, I always tell my uh, – my, uh, uh, nephew, he's like six three, and he's like, well, and he knows I'm an American car guy. Yeah. I, I kind of cry about all the foreign cars, and he goes, "What do you think about a Miata?" And he he was thinking I was going to say something bad. I'm like, you know what? Be honest, with you, Miatas are awesome, especially oh, yeah. like if you're in a road course race and stuff like that. Yeah. And he goes, uh, I said, so if you're going to try to build a race car, I said Miata's the way to go. Yeah, terrible. He's like, no, I'm going to daily drive it. I'm like, no. He's like, why not? I was like. Cause you're six three, bro. I was yeah, like, you know, unless you're just gonna drive it with the top off in the summer or yeah. heavily modify that car, and I go, go sit in one. Yeah, the thing I'm jonesing for really bad now, and I, I kind of go in and out. Um, they didn't go de- as cheap as I had hoped they would, and I don't think they're gonna get lower as the C7 Corvette. Yeah, I mean that is. Uh, when that car came out, I was at Road and Track at the time, and and I drove so many Corvettes uh, on the track, you know, because I ended up being like a chief test driver that would get the lap times and things. Yeah. And those cars, they would do anything you wanted, but there was some numbness somewhere where it never felt connected. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know why, but you'd be driving on the track, and you didn't. You, some cars, like you get this innate feeling that it's a part of you. The Corvette never felt like that really? until the C7. Okay, until the C7. And then it was like, oh, here we go. Yeah. And they got that killer motor. You know, they got all the stuff that Styland thinks beautiful. Yeah. Like a good low mile one. Like, I like it better than the C8. You know, I do C7, too. But that's yeah. just me. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, a lot of the car guys say that, you know, dollar for dollar, if you want to have a high performance car mm-hmm. and you want to have fun and it'd be somewhat reliable, you know, because high just performance put cars are, are, yeah, typically not reliable. <laughs> Everyone says like the Corvette is, you know, at yeah. the top or the top of the list. Do you thousand, agree with that? Thousand percent. Or, thousand percent. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean a C7 um, for that. F- like you used to, so we used to do these comparison tests. They were big, and every time in like the late '90s and early 2000s, there was always a new version of the 911 and a new version of the Corvette, and we'd get them both and we'd take them to a track. And the 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 verdict was always, "Yep, this Corvette is faster in every way than this Porsche." But which one would we want? We want the Porsche. It feels better. <laughs> and then you get to the C7, and then that that went away. And so you still get all the attributes of it. They're crazy fast. The throttle response is like is so brilliant. There's no big displacement, and but you still get that sort of intangible, subjective, hard to describe connectiveness to the contact patch. Yeah. And that was the car that did it. And they look dynamite. Yeah, I've I've always been a big fan of the Corvette. Well, yeah. I shouldn't say always. I mean, I. I uh, the 80s and 90s were a dark time for American automobiles, but we won't get into that. <laughs> yeah, the C3 is coming back, though, because <laughs> they look so cool. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, but that car looks good. I go, I agree. It looks good, but have you ever driven it? Yeah, they're just, you know? it's it's hard. You know, I had that 69 uh, Chevelle Swagon, super cool car. I had a 65 Mustang for a while. And that era is tough. Yeah, they're pretty crude. Yeah, I mean they're they're really cool in a lot of ways. They're stylistically, they sound great. Drive like a tractor. They just yeah, and like it depends what you're looking for in yeah. a car. Like I'm, I spend a lot of time in them. I go on a lot of curvy roads, and they yeah. just they just haven't fit that. I mean, but once you drive a modern car, that's like you know, like guys like us. You know, we will take an old car for its styling, for its beauty, for yeah. its history, or whatever, and then we'll make it a modern car underneath it. Yeah, you know, and I mean, and I don't necessarily mean like LS motor. You can still keep that pre eighty six small block Chevy in there if that's what you're into. You can still go carbureted. Don't know why you would, you know, but I mean, you still could. <laughs> but at least the suspension and the brakes yeah. and and it, you know quiet that thing down a little bit, yeah. you know, so it's not so noisy. Totally. You know, but I mean. I mean, some of the ones that they're doing there, you know, that Ultima batteries, that, sh- that uh, what do they call Ultima it? Ultima battery challenge, that race series. Yeah, and it's yeah. basically pro, I mean, and, and, okay, this is a good question for you. What the hell is the difference between pro touring and resto mod? Is there any difference? Same. I mean, I mean, <laughs> there'd be, you know, you guys can comment down below what <laughs> you think, but uh, I mean. That that I don't like the internet speak to be honest. With you. Oh. Everyone comes up with this name and then and I'm not saying about pro touring or anything like yeah. that, but it's it's everybody has to like, oh, this is exactly what it means. Like, you know, what is a supercar? What is a hypercar? Oh, you know, like and, and yeah. people argue and like, you know, there was a time where people would go, you know, like with the supercar, it had to be a mid engine. 
It had to be capable of going 180 miles an hour. It had, and I'm like, so that yeah. means the CA Corvette is a supercar. Oh, no, no, no. That's not a supercar. That's an American muscle car. Or that's an American sports car. I'm like, well, it's mid-engine and it goes. The Z06 over. is every bit a supercar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I spent yeah. some time on last summer. I think it's pretty amazing. I mean, talk about smart engineers. You've seen that that engine. Yeah. That 670 horsepower, five and a half liter flat plane crank. That thing is bonkers yeah bonker motors i got friends that work at milford and they yeah. they get the tests and stuff and they always will send me pictures and videos and stuff oh yeah you need to buy one of these I'm yeah like, you do i'm like i'm only 100 grand off buddy if I, <laughs> you know once i get that extra 100 i'm gonna, maybe i'll get one and a half you know okay how about like uh favorite american engines like this engine i can't believe was ever produced and and i guess there's it's not there's a little challenges with it but that ls7 engine still strikes me as like just one of the all-time great V8s ever made. Yeah, no, the L yeah. the LS platform is is yeah. ar arguably one of the best you know motors ever ever produced. Right. I mean, you know, for the old time guys, it's obviously the pre eighty six small block Chevy. Or if you're a big block guy, especially if you're Camaro GM guy, uh, it's hard to beat the four twenty seven. Like when I built my Camaro, that was one of the things, and everyone's like, "Well, why not just go four fifty four? Or why not go five seventy two? Or why?" Because there's something about 427 and Camaro, probably from like Yanko and stuff out in your neck of woods. So, so you just wanted that number. Yes. Yes. I, well, I wanted oh. the old school feel and the number and, and oh. all that. But yeah, I, and ironically, I wouldn't have went 454. I ended up going small block, but I wouldn't have went 454. I would have went 427 because of the history and the heritage. And, mm. and everyone goes, why don't you LS it? Why don't you LS it? Because every other car that I build is LS. And, and I'm not hating yeah. on the LS. But I want to remember it like when I was in high school. Yeah, yeah. You well, know? it's a canvas. Like yeah. that's what the fun of a car. It's a, it's a, it's really is a canvas. You do whatever you want. Okay, I hear a story. Maybe you can you can verify it or not because I haven't. I don't know how true it is. But you remember, it's been like the late '80s. General Motors bought Lotus. Yeah. And uh, they were trying to figure out something to do with the Corvette, and they had Lotus design a new V8 called the LT5, double overhead cam, something like 320 horsepower. And the story I heard was that the GM powertrain people, that ticked them off. And so then they answered with that thing called, I think it was the LT1. Yeah. It was 300 horsepower. Yeah. And then the the second answer to that was the LS. Yeah. And that is the, I don't know, the coup de gras, yeah. the uh, most, you know, I don't know what other adjectives you can give on it. But, I mean, in terms of, like, everybody talks about power and all that stuff, but what they what they what was the brilliance of that motor, in my mind, was that the, the general en engineers – and, you know, sometimes General Motors doesn't make the best cars, but that's not the engineer's fault. I mean, yes. you and I just talked about it. Whenever you go up there, it, it always blows my mind how much these people know. And I remember talking to them uh, in, in the 90s about that motor. And at the time, everyone said that America was uh, behind the times and stuck in the past because they didn't make overhead cam engines. And here comes the new V8. What does... General Motors do it's still push rods. Yeah, <laughs> and I remember the guy saying, "Yeah, you know, he's like, there's so many benefits to this. This motor is four inches lower than a double over cam motor. It's this much shorter. It weighs this much less. It makes so much fewer parts. And if you look at an engine bay of a Corvette from them, you look at it like a double over cam V8, and let's say a Porsche Cayenne, you immediately go, oh." I get it. And they were making all the power. Yeah. Like, that's one of the reasons I just love that engine, because it just totally bucked conventional wisdom, and yeah. it did what was right. I, I never was big into building motors and stuff, to be honest with you, the mechanical side of it. I always hated it. My dad is a master mechanic, and yeah. he, he would build race motors. And oh, I yeah. think that's why I didn't like it, because, oh, you, yeah. know, I, you know, that's why I went to pain body or whatever. But, I mean, you know, he's... Body guys are usually good mechanics, too, which is funny. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's a nerd when it comes to like uh, you know building motors and like back you know he'd have to read the books and talk about Smokey Yannick and Grumpy Jenkins and what they did here <laughs> yeah, and there, yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, you know and and all of his friends were like you know nerd and I mean that in a positive way nerd mechanic yeah. uh, horsepower guys and like what was truth for lack of a better word forever is like the small block Chevy was one of the best motors ever built you know the pre eighty six SBC and then. They would always say, oh, how about that inline Ford, that 300, you know, and I'm not talking about necessarily for performance, but, you know, the thing would just go and was a torque monster. 
But then you bring up the LS, and they're like, oh, well, that's just in a different category. It's a mic drop. Yeah, it's just, you yeah. know, it's like, you know, people, oh, small block is the best ever. But what about the, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's every one of them, you know, yeah. for their whole life, it was this or that. And then when you bring up the LS, it's like, no, that's, like you said, it's a mic drop. It's game over. It is. You know, but, the, you know, the, the, the thing is... Th- so many companies have answered. I mean, I'm I'm a huge fan of that Coyote V8. I was That's just going to say that. that thing is. Here's the other thing: I've, I've never gotten a good answer. I've always wanted to know. So, you have a 302 Ford small block that I had in my Fox body. Yeah. And it's essentially, you know, architecturally very similar to small block Chevy. Yep. They could not sound more different. Yeah. And I never, I don't know why. Do you have any idea why? I have no clue. But like the Ford you. sounds better. Yeah. It just does. You put the flows on my Mustang. The thing. It's Best amazing part of the car. that new Coyote motor, the horsepower that they're getting out of it. Oh, blows yeah. my mind. Because, I mean, this was like truth in, in, in my age, and you, you can dispute it if you want. It's what we took as fact. If you want, let's say you have a 400 cubic inch motor, whatever. You know, you have 400 cubic inch. Yep. If you wanted a dependable car, you could make it 400 horsepower. If you wanted a, a sort of dependable car, so you could get one horsepower per cubic inch. If That's you wanted it yeah. sort of dependable, you could get one and a half. So out of 400 cubes, you get maybe 600 horsepower. You're not going to work on it every day, but you're going to work on it maybe every month. If you want a race car and you're going to mess with that thing every day, you might be able to get two horsepower per cubic inch. So you can get 800 horsepower. Yeah, and then it won't of, idle. And, and that's it. And yeah. you're going to work on it all the time. Yeah. And that was fact forever. Everybody knew it. And then here comes the Coyote motor. And that guy, uh, Paul Tsai Performance in Jackson, Michigan, I hear that they're putting over a thousand horsepower to the ground out of the three hundred twos, and they're and they're pretty reliable. I'm not saying like they'll go a hundred thousand. Well, why does it surprise you though? Look what the, the <laughs> what look at what Dodge is doing with their Hemi. Yeah, I mean, what's it? Is that Hemi still out there? They, it's that, still out there. It's still there. <laughs> right. So this is uh, 2024, not 2025. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, think I, that... I love the Hemi. I mean, be honest with you, and again, I love all American cars or all cars in general. Is when Dodge came out with the Magnum and then the the three hundred C platform, like an 05 or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and again, Dodge has, in a lot of ways, been like the third step uh, son or step cousin yeah. to the other, you know, two in the big three. Sure. I think Dodge kind of forced Chevy and Ford's hand a little bit. They said, "Look, we're going to bring this old throwback, this Hemi, these older cars." And you know Ford and GM followed suit. Some say they out, you know, outdid them. Whatever. But I mean, I think Ford made that play in the early 2000s. I think that we everybody benefited from it. Yeah, I mean, nothing occurs in a vacuum, right? And even if you look in the music industry, where everybody samples everybody else, and the same happens in every business, and it's no different in the car business. So, yeah. you know, you might say that the the Hemi was the response to the LS, right? Yeah. Pushrod, 5.7 liter. You know, and they did all kinds of things. They made it 6.4 liter. They supercharged it. Um, whatever. I mean, to me, they're always that's the scrappy company that doesn't have the same resources, yeah. and they figure out how to do something special with it. And they did, and yeah. they kept doubling down. I mean, I, I was raised Ford and Chevy, and like a Dodge was like pretty much a foreign car. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, that's just. I mean, being a south, <laughs> growing up in southeastern Michigan, is that I the mean, way it was? It, it was. Oh, I mean, wow. not for everybody. Yeah. But like back in my day. And it's like, why do you like Ford? Why do you like Chevy? Well, because that's what my dad did, or or my uncle worked for Ford, yeah. or my uncle worked for GM. So all we do is GM. Yeah. But it, and the rest of the country is not like that. And and, and things are changing now in twenty twenty four beyond. But like, if you had a foreign car back then, it was like, you know, you were a communist or something like that. I know, but then <laughs> you know, if if you think about, um, I remember my dad crashes his Dodge Daytona, right, and then he replaces it with a. I want to say 86 or 87 Honda Prelude. Yeah. That thing blew our minds. Oh, yeah. They were great cars. <laughs> <laughs> the way it was put together, that motor, like you hear it, it's like, well, the motor is a sewing machine. And you're like, what does that mean? I'm like, well, it's a four cylinder and they shake. Yeah. That thing could be idling. You could put your hand on the valve cover and you don't feel a thing. They'd get it, though. Unbelievable. You know, they'd get it. Yeah. I you mean, know, it was amazing how fast that they were. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm more omnivore yeah. than I am. Yeah. The loyal to one. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think as I age, I, I get that way. But I mean, you know, full disclosure, I mean, when I was growing up, I mean, if, <laughs> in, in it, but Jeep wasn't uh, 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 in the Chrysler family. 
Oh, which that what? makes no sense. Yeah, because they bought AMC. No, no, early. I'm talking even after that. Even uh, after Chrysler the bought them, like no, 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 that doesn't count. Even though they've owned them for <laughs> ten or twenty years, that's not a, a Dodge, right? You yeah. know, and, and this is the way a lot of people in Southeast in Michigan thought, or whatever. Wait, okay, let's go back to EVs. So, don't you think that every vintage first gen Bronco or Blazer or Jeep is a perfect EV? It could be a good platform for it. I mean, you know what? I mean. I'll I'll take it a, a step uh, farther. Is why not use the Scouts because they're they're Scout. pretty raggedy and yeah. junkety anyway. I mean, <laughs> like, why not keep the Broncos and the and the CJs or whatever yeah. for the diehards? But and I love the way the Scouts look. They look great. They just uh, they're not. But my point is, good. no nobody drives them regularly. Yeah, and so you want the thing to work when you want it. And you know, you know, you sit a, a internal combustion engine. What happens? Right, the battery yeah. drains. The fuel, you know, comes up in the flow. Whatever it is. You're more likely to have an issue where it doesn't start. Where yeah. an electric, you go out, it's going to start. Yeah, I don't know. Or, something I've been wondering about. Or catch about. your garage on fire. Whatever comes first, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you can just keep it out like in a carport or whatever. <laughs> well, obviously, you drove a lot of cool cars. You got to test drive a lot of cool cars sure. and stuff. I'm sure you met a lot of cool people. Yeah. What cool, interesting, or famous people did you meet or like? Or I guess oh man, there's famous. so many. Um, and and. And you know, as we talk about automotive passion, the uh, I was just at Jay Leno's place. We were interviewing him for stuff we did, and we went for a ride in his Duesenberg. Wow! And it was really fun to be outside of his garage there in L.A. because the whole city they all know him. Yeah. And you pull up to a, a stoplight, and Jay's in you know this Duesenberg, and everybody just loves him. Yeah. Jay, hey man, how you doing? And you know, I've known him for uh, a fair amount of time, and um, his enthusiasm is so legit, and yeah. and his like knowledge he's it's crazy uh, yeah. what he drops like just in casual conversation you know and we were talking about Duesenberg. he's like hey you know these things take 40 hours to adjust the valves <laughs> you know <laughs> say something like that like yeah. he's the best so there's there's that and uh you know as we talked about before the 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 amount of creativity and passion and smarts in the business continues to it just always it just amazes me. It humbles me all, all yeah. the time, you know. Yeah. The one thing I was curious about is the um, the the rock stars in the car world to me. Yeah. Are the designers. Yeah. And um, let's take uh, you probably met him. You know Ralph Gilles. He's the head yeah. of Stellantis. Yeah. Right. And I think you guys probably worked with him. Fascinating dude. Yeah. Because like, he he can wrench. Yeah. And he races. And he designs. Like the designers are typically the end to end like like uber car people because they can do it all and i'm just so in awe of you know people that can take the same raw material and make something look really cool because i can't ralph was one of the big guys uh who gave us our break uh when ralph geals yeah, right yeah, yeah he uh he gave us our break when we got oh. our first car to see him through the school oh yeah so it's like I don't know 2005. So that's believe it or not 20 years ago or, or, or close. Oh, is uh, we were building this Dodge Magnum. It was the first year of the Magnum. And, right, uh, I remember. We had some uh, some Chrysler uh, engineer who was taking welding classes, and he just happened to wander by the shop and goes, "Wow, how'd you guys get a new Magnum already?" And oh, we're building it for our car show, and we're doing this that. You mind if I take a couple pictures? Sure. Well, that goes all around Mopar. Everyone's seeing it, talking about it, talking about it. And then one of Ralph's people got with us and said, hey, we're having this SEMA deal. So they would have their SEMA oh, display. Right. And, you know, you want to bring it down to yeah. world headquarters. Of course. So we go down there, meet the guy, nicest dude in the world. And uh, he goes, hey, you know, are you interested in taking this to SEMA? SEMA's like in a week. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, we can't get into SEMA like that. He's like, well, what if I could, like, get it there and pay for the transportation? Would you be interested? Sure. He goes, hang on a second. Walks away. He's on his phone. He's like, okay, it's going. Awesome. And I'm like, yeah, that's like rough. that quick on a finger? Yeah. And it was the nicest guy in the world to us. You yeah, know? you know, it's funny. I just remembered. I forgot about this piece. We, when I was a car and driver uh, in Washington Community College, we partnered with you guys to do a Acura Integra. Yeah. And there was a couple students that worked on it. Yep. And I was Phil so and Adam. so impressed with these kids. And I remember calling Ralph saying, Hey, you gotta know these guys. They're not, they're creative, they're good. And we had lunch, the three of us. Yep. 
with Ralph, and I think he ended up hiring Adam. Okay. Yeah. yeah and good so, kids. Yeah, really good know. kids. They're not kids anymore. I think they're both about 40 now. Can you believe that? That's yeah. how long it's No, been. Adam's got this really funny Mitsubishi short stubby SUV. But I can't believe I can't forget the name, but he's got one he brought over from Brazil. So, yeah, it's super. Yeah. yeah. I've I seen it on, like, social media. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is either. I was like, yep, that's totally those guys. Yeah, it's totally those you know? guys. Totally those So guys. that's what's fun about what you do and your program there. And, um, you know, you've tried so many different things at the school to sort of, I don't know, every time I'm there, I'm so impressed, and I, I, I get more bitter that it wasn't available to me when yeah. I was that age. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You must learn a lot about kids and, and what they're doing. What are you seeing in these generations that are coming in? Uh, you know, it's it's you're, funny. You're, you teach just body, or you guys are you still doing custom cars? How do you work yeah. that in? What do you do? I mean, Washnall teaches everything: welding, yeah. mechanics. I mean, we even do EV everything. But if we're talking about me, I typically lean towards just teaching paint and body. Paint and body I okay. do do uh, customizing and hot rods and restoration and stuff like that too. I, I like the older stuff, uh, and, I, and I do lean towards paint. But, uh, you, but know, you guys had a big custom car program. You took yeah. on these. I mean, I remember writing about that Ford GT with a Ford 500. I think it was yeah, crazy. Yeah, we still own it. Oh, do or, you? Or I, I shouldn't say still own it. We now own it. So when Ford did the CEO switch with Farley, I think his last name is, the current one. Yeah, it's Farley. Is uh, Before he came in, Ford was always worried, like, oh, we're getting a new CEO, and what if he scraps and gets rid of all the projects before his time? Which, you know, I don't think that's the case. But, I mean, I they, were, they, were like, they yeah. sold it to us for a dollar. Oh, great. That's so, we, so Washington owns it. That was like 20 years ago. Yeah. It took 20 years to get that done? Oh, no, no. Oh, to get the car? Yeah. yeah, Ford had it. I mean, we we had it in our possession the whole time. Yeah. But they gave it to us finally, officially. Well, what did you learn after that? I mean, I love the idea because you're trying to uh, – I remember speaking to you about it, and you were very clear. You're like, look, um, you know, just doing paint and dent repair may not be that exciting. Yeah. But what I wanted to show, and I'm using your words, was that – this opens up a whole world to you, wherever you want to go, not just a job. And you can, it can be just a job, but there's yeah. this whole, not, and, and did it work? It's, it's, we call it the carrot and the stick. It, oh. Is, you know, like, I mean, not everyone's going to work on million dollar prototypes and hot rods, of course. Set, which is fine. Yeah. But I mean, you, you have to have, nobody wants to work on, you know, what they perceive as lame cars or, or, or doing sure. work that's beneath them or whatever. So the cool thing about working on, let's say, older cars or or prototypes or customs or, yeah, or low yeah. riders or jacked up trucks or whatever they're into is they're learning the same skill set, you know, because you still got to bump a dent and take things apart and sand it and clean it and prime it and paint it. I mean, what difference does it make if it's on a 2024 Honda Civic that they perceive as, you know, a nothing car or a 1964 SS Impala, you know, with a 409 in it? And, and, and like, so basically we're, we're tricking them, for lack of a better word. Is Well, no, I get that, but it, it, it's easy to say. I'm, I'm wondering, it must be hard to pull off. It is. It's uh, Like to have the cars there that can be worked on and then to make sure, you know, that's a different level of – execution that it's done to that level right and, and unfortunately uh most of the time the administration doesn't get it they don't understand what we're doing just or what money. we're about yeah, yeah. And, and they think that we're crazy which yeah we are a little bit or whatever but right. i mean you, you got to fuel that passion and stuff and uh yeah i mean washington has been really good to me i went there as a student and yeah. in the early or mid 90s i uh started going there as a student graduated and mm -hmm. then i had an opportunity to go back and teach part-time and i've been there full-time so mm -hmm. I got nothing but good things to say about Washtenaw, but you know we've we've had some unique builds, and for the people who don't know what we're talking about is uh, around 2005, uh, Ford came out with what we will call the GT40, but it was actually the Ford GT uh, yeah. project, yeah, and that was back when they were still V8s. Uh, but Ford said uh, we basically want we have this. Ford 500, which was like the, the Taurus. Sedan. Yeah. yeah, it was like their new Taurus because they were scrapping the Taurus. They said, "Hey, we want you to make this car sexy and appealing to the the youth." And you know how people like all these kids are into their Honda Civics and buying parts on eBay. We want the Ford 500 to be like that, or at least this you know this uh, project we were working on. And we jokingly said, "Look, nobody thinks of Ford. No kid thinks of Ford 500 is cool." You know, it's the, the JDM market is different. Yeah, but if uh, if I may jump in there, yeah. I would be if I was in your shoes, I would have said, well, if I can pull this off, 
and establish a good relationship with Ford, that could be super beneficial in terms of not just resources, know-how, expertise, but also, you know, give the kids, the students, um, you know, a leg up to a big employer. Yeah. And, 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 and ironically, yeah. that's what happened. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we jokingly said to them, like, hey, give us a Ford GT car and we'll cut it up and we'll put it in the car. Oh, is that right? And we were kidding. <laughs> you know, we were going to do the project. We were going to do the project. We were just crying that it wasn't a Mustang or something sure. cooler. And they go, we like it. And so they, they did it. Wow. And, I mean, Ford was great to work with. And I'm not, I'm not just saying that to, you know – that was a big project. Place. I it remember I wrote about it. I was there. I think <laughs> I drove it too. Yeah, I drove yeah. it. Did I drove it or does it? Yeah. yeah, it was uh that was complicated. That was when the electronics started really getting complicated and way above and beyond fabrication and um yeah. and body work. Yeah, we basically just took a, a, a four door car. Yeah. We blew it all out. We cut with a sawzall, we cut a Ford GT in half, oh and we gosh. stuffed the chassis in the back seat. So it's truly a mid engine supercharged V eight car that was capable of doing almost two hundred miles an hour. I don't know who would do that. I mean it, it, she's heavy too. She's five thousand pounds. Well, I was just thinking like, okay, there's one thing to build a car like that, but then there's another way to somehow uh put it into a curriculum yeah. that is helping a student advance to a degree. Yeah. That must have been the challenge. Yeah. I mean, the cool thing is, is that like, you know, when you're around these young people and, and they get it and they're like coming in early and staying late and they're like, oh, this is the best thing ever. I hated yeah. school and I love coming to this oh, class. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's like... You know that's the big thing for us, and and we're we're blessed that we we have those kind of students. So what did you like? That was I remember. I mean, just endless late nights. Oh yeah. Like I mean, you guys, the midnight oil was insane in that. I yeah. mean, what was your takeaway when that was done? Because you haven't done something that crazy since. Yeah. What What did you learn? Out of oh, that? we we did the Impala. That was pretty big since. I mean, it oh. was a different kind of car, but yeah, it was. I mean, the funny thing when we did the Impala is. The car was done, and it, it was painted. It was ready to go to the Detroit Autorama. We oh, send, I remember that one, yeah. We send pictures into it, and they go, wow, this is beautiful. Would you guys be interested in being on the roll? And and, and for people who don't know, Riddler roll, that's you know the Riddler in, in my world, the world of customizing. You get the grade eight, or you get the Riddler. It's like an you know, Oscar. Oh, yeah it's, yeah, it's huge. And we're like, hell yeah. So we leave. <laughs> we go back, and we're driving back, and we're like, that car's got all undercoat underneath it because that's the way we bought it. And we just painted the top. It was a, a really nice car. And we're like, that car is not Riddler Row material. So we went back. We talked to the students. This is like Ramas in like 30 days, 40 Can days. Can I back you up for yeah. a sec? Because yeah. here's the crazy thing if people don't understand about Autorama yeah. is it's not just uh, the creativity. It's the craftsmanship. And, and it's every – it's like a – it's a contest for OCD. Like I think – I don't know. People, they're a little strange because oh, yeah. the game is every bolt head is perfect yeah. and aligned, and that means they put mirrors under the car so you could see that the underside is as nice as the top, which is what you're talking about, yeah. right? Yeah, We when you call us OCD and crazy, we actually don't count it as an insult. We're like, yes, You guys are. are crazy. We, we know. Yeah. You know, before I was doing hot rods and stuff, I had a collision shop uh, in the Ypsilanti area, and that's, you know, what my family did is we did paint and body. And, mm. and, and again, this may not be a surprise to you, but – if you own a body shop, if you come from that world, you don't dislike insurance companies. You hate insurance companies. You hate them. You hate them. They, and every body and paint guy will tell you this. I mean, if they tell you different, they're probably not telling the truth. Right. Is they're the enemies, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, there's a part of me that still feels that way. Right. But to be honest with you, you know, and Haggerty is a Michigan-based company. Yeah. And Haggerty, you know, again, and I, I want you to tell me a little bit more about Haggerty because sure. you know way more about it than I do. And back in the day, Haggerty was just a place that you would go and you would buy insurance for your old car. Right. And they would take care of your old car. And it was a little cheaper, but they knew old cars. And we never had that distrust and that hate for Did you Haggerty. work with them back then? Oh, yeah. We did oh. a lot of work for Haggerty. Oh. And, and there was Haggerty wasn't the only ones that we didn't hate. Right. But out of all the ones that I worked with, Haggerty was the most fair. They were nice. Uh -huh. They weren't the enemy. They yeah. wanted to get the car done. But what is Haggerty about in 2024? I mean, they're not just an insurance company anymore. Yeah, totally. That's still the core of the business, though. And it's uh, it's insuring and and uh, cars that you don't drive every day. And what does that mean? That means up to something you buy right now to, you know, your 19, 
15 Model T. So yes, it's definitely expanded, but the core selling proposition remains. And that is we know cars. So when you say that your 66 Mustang is not worth 15,000, like the other agency is saying, because you've done this, it's worth 30. We're going to say, oh yeah, we see what you mean. And okay, got it. That's step number one. And then step number two, should something happen? I've watched the claims department and it brings like a tear to my eye every time because when somebody calls and says I crashed my car, they understand that your baby was just damaged. Yeah. So then they'll go, okay, how do we make this better? Yeah. Do you do you have a shop you like to use? If they have a shop, we'll pay the shop. Yeah. Do you not have a shop? No, we'll find you a shop. Or do you, do you just want the check? Oh, tell us what it is. And then they also have this thing that we don't, I don't think we do a really good job of, of marketing that, it's called. It's an add-on to insurance called Cherish Salvage. Have you ever heard of this? No. It's amazing. I just upped it on my policy, and it's not a lot. But what it says is like if you get an accident and your car's totaled, they'll pay you out, and then you also get the carcass. Wow. And so That's it's great. It's great. Of course, yeah. I'm like, who? Would, yeah. I, I, there's some uh, regulatory reason it's not on every policy because who wouldn't want that? Of course, yeah. you want all the parts. Yeah, exactly. You may want to rebuild for it the from next another one. Job. Yeah. yeah, rebuild it or, or use the parts for the next one. So it's it's absolutely totally built on uh, enthusiasts for enthusiasts. The guy, uh, the family who started it, the Haggerty family, um, they were totally into old boats and old cars, and they knew that community. They knew there was a need. They happened to know insurance, so they're like, "Well, let's try this," and yeah. it just went crazy because they found a, a niche so do they only insure cars for people who live in michigan <laughs> no, no 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 we actually have a uh uh it's nationwide canada it's also we have an outlet in the uk and if you go uh somewhere in europe they will they will figure out a way to handle it too so it's all about enabling your passion is really what it's about and then in the past eight years since i've been there um you know Haggerty's branched out in a lot of ways to sort of uh you know, really kind of stoke that passion and to help people enjoy their cars more. So they do media. That's why I was hired. We have some events that we run, some concours. We also now started the big thing is a marketplace, which includes an auction function, which is really fascinating because they're based out of here in Detroit as well. And what they do is they, uh, they, uh, I'm going to butcher this, but they're trying to make it a, a safe place to buy and sell a car. So most auction platforms, as soon as that that auction ends, yeah. the platform's out. So whatever happens then, and you know, you've probably bought cars yeah. on, on digital auctions. Yep. You gonna wire somebody you don't know forty grand? I have. You have. <laughs> I have too, right? So what these these folks do here at Haggerty is uh, so I sold my, my my Fox body on it and I had to send them the title and I had to send them the photos and the paperwork. So they had all this stuff uh, in in hand. Yeah. And they knew the title was clear. They knew the car was paid off. And then when the, when the person won the auction, that person paid Haggerty. Yeah, and that's, then when, a, that's a huge help, man, because I'll tell you what, not only is it scary, I mean, even for car guys, yeah. it's scary. I mean, I, I don't know the, the stats, but it, I bet it turns a lot of people turns, off. Turns a lot. A lot we lot heard a lot. That's why, that's why we started it. And so they, when, uh, when my Mustang sold and they said, um, yep, we got the money. You can you know, let the, the car go. And they came up and they got the car. And now if the person came up and the car had been hugely misrepresented, they would have been able to go back to Haggerty and the, you know some process would have started if it was really, really bad. Yeah. So um, there's that level of protection. So that's all that Haggerty's so trying like to do. It's like buying a house where they hold it in escrow, right? It's exactly like, what it is. This is great. But that, there's I mean, just that's... a level, like we're going to be there to make sure that you know, when you buy your new baby, it's as fun of a process as you hope for. I mean, that just totally, usually when something changes or it's new, I hate it, you right. know? And I mean, that's actually makes sense to yeah. me, you know? So they're trying to do stuff like that and um, more stuff like that coming all. It's always about serving this automotive enthusiast, which, you know, I had a great gig at Road and Track, but I realized that this company was going to be a way for me to really take part in this community that I get so much out of. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's because I'm in Michigan or whatever. I've known about Haggerty for a long time, used their services, and yeah. I mean, I've never. And I'm not saying this because I'm talking to you. I've never had a bad experience with them. And then everybody that I know who's dealt with them, they say nothing but great things. And again, and this is coming from the world that we hate the insurance company, and, and yeah. it's like, it's like we hate them all. Oh, but not them. <laughs> it's amazing uh, the the scale of the training that goes on to make sure that everybody that answers the phones really knows cars. They do employee restorations. 
They have a fleet of cars that they send the employees out to drive. So, you know, it's all about making sure that you're dealing with people that you trust and I so like if it. I want to get insurance through Haggerty, what do I do? What's the best? You just way? go to you go to the website Haggerty.com. You can get a quote. Okay. There's a number there you can call. Get a well, quote. What I've noticed too is that like my uh, my old '60 Cadillac mm -hmm. convertible, I, it was a '62 series, mm -hmm. and I mean, it, and I had a lot of money into it, and they mm -hmm. said, you know, hey, we think it's worth this much, and I said, no, no it's worth more than that. Mm -hmm. and they said, okay, you know, what do you want to insure it for? And I yeah. said, well, I want to insure it for this. No problem. And oh, I'm they like, did? Oh, yeah. It was good. No, no problem. Yeah. Sometimes and, it gets a little tricky yep. with really crazy builds yep. where they're like, well, you say it's worth half a million. It's really yeah. worth, you know. Oh, it wasn't worth anything like that. But I mean, <laughs> they, they wanted to see pictures of it. And they, sure. Is it stored in the garage and how many, you know, yeah. but I mean, it was all easy answers. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, no problem. And yeah. uh, it was surprisingly inexpensive yeah. to, to insure it. Yeah, I don't. I mean, the 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 prices. Um, I I don't know anything about it, right? I do the media yeah. stuff. I just know I hear all the time when I'm out and about. Um, is that you hear the stories when somebody got in an accident, and Haggerty will make sure it's as painless as possible to get you back to where you if were. If you got a a fifty thousand dollar F one fifty and you're paying X amount of dollars a month, you got a fifty thousand dollar Camaro Mustang. I guarantee to ensure the fifty thousand dollar sure. hot rod through Haggerty is. is a lot less. Yeah, because you use it less. <laughs> yeah. 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 But you might be using it like in a crazy way too or whatever. <laughs> or, yeah, but it's know. fun. Like this is why we do a lot of free media. The YouTube channel is free. We now have a, uh, a, a, a on uh, an always on channel on Samsung TV Plus. It's channel 1194. It's a Haggerty channel. We see all our videos for free as well. Awesome. Free stuff on our social media, Instagram, Facebook, and then on the website, Haggerty.com. There's all kinds of stuff. So, it's all about uh, enabling automotive passion. David was telling me, David, our partner, my partner who's behind the camera, he was telling me about something that I wasn't aware of. He said that Haggerty has this deal now, and I'm going to mess it up a little bit, Yeah, that you guys basically highlight like a couple cars were like, hey, if you buy this car for this price or this model year and you own it for X amount of years, you'll break even or make oh, a little yeah. money on it. We spoke about that earlier. That's the bull market. Okay. So we've done that for seven years. And seven so, years. Right? Yeah. So there's 70 cars that we've said, look, based on we're tracking all this data, we're not this. We're not in this for an investment. If yeah. you think you're going to make money at this, you're lying and yeah. you're a fool. But you can have a lot of fun for not a lot of money because a lot of these cars will hold their value or they'll creep up a little bit. I mean, even if you break even on a car, that's it's a great. win. Yeah, it's a, all it's a they win. win. Yeah, I think car people, you, they lie through their teeth. Oh, they all say, "Well, I made all this money, bought it yeah. for twenty, I sold it for twenty-five, and I'm I'm unapologetic like my Mustang. I'm like." Yeah, I bought it for twelve. I put seven in it. I sold it for fifteen. Yeah. That was a win. Yeah, win. No, I had I, so much fun with that car. I, I can tell you this: uh, I'm the the master at buying a car, putting a year or two of my life in it, getting a hundred grand into it, and selling it for fifty. Yeah. If they're in like the the old the old saying is, you want to know how to become a millionaire building cars? Start off with two. Two. Yeah. You'll be a millionaire be real quick. So and, and I'm, I've mastered that. So if anybody wants to know how to lose a ton of money building cars. But I mean, for me, when I build them, that's what I love about them. And then when I get them done, I'm like, eh, I want to go to the next one. I just want to get rid of I it. Mean, and go to the next I mean, I always say, think it's about sickness. my Fox Body Mustang. Like I said, I think, let's say I bought it for 12. I yeah. know I put, I had 18 in it. And what did I spend that six on? Um, my kids and I took it apart. We put a clutch in it. We put exhaust on it. We all did this stuff in the garage. Then we took some road trips with it. Hours and hours of non-prescriptive time where we're we are running the experience it's not yeah. being dictated to us yeah and then when i sold it you know at the end of the day i was out three grand yeah is that where else are you going to get that kind but of a experience lot of people are like but also you lost all of that money in your labor you didn't get paid for your labor they, they oh, don't get it on. they don't get it oh you yeah know? and you're, you're, well, you're going about it the wrong way we're not professionals <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so you know so let's say I wanted to get a, a look at this list of these, you know, fifty or seventy cars or whatever, and I wanted to buy sure. a car. How do how do I see that? It's all on Haggerty.com slash forward slash media. Just okay. search bull market. Bull and, market. Yeah, and actually, okay. if you search Haggerty bull market in any Google, like all the sites pick it up. Okay. And uh, we actually look back at previous years to see how we're doing. The track record is phenomenal. Is it all like old cars? Like it, well, we American we, cars. We or purposely or? mix it. This mix year, it for example, we had a Lamborghini Countach. Ooh. We had a Chrysler Town and Country Convertible. It was like, what's that, a 40s car? <laughs> we had, uh, it was a pickup truck. And so there's always a variety. We try and make sure it's not six-figure cars. It's not all $10,000 cars. So we try and make sure there's a great mix, something for everybody. People our age don't like Lamborghini Countach. We didn't grow up with the poster <laughs> on the wall or nothing like that. Nothing don't like that. Yeah, no, no, nothing I mean, like that. Yeah. 
that that was always my one of the posts that we just did. Uh, we haven't actually released it yet. Is you know your favorite American car, your favorite non-American car, and I picked the '88 Lamborghini LP5000. Yeah, and and it, and it's and again, I love the Lamborghini. Was not the best built car. Was not the fastest car. I'm not saying they're junk. I'm not saying they're slow. But yeah. there's so many other cars that were built better. That was faster. But I purely picked it because of my age and what that did to my generation. Yeah. Is every kid we I had a trapper keeper if you remember those of the Lamborghini. Yeah. And I was a horrible speller. I can spell Lamborghini still this day because I love them that much. Yeah, we think there's room in them. And actually, we were very specific about that one because in '89 that that anniversary edition of the Countach. That's when Chrysler owned them. They were spending money. They got really fast, and the build quality was better. So. You know, we hear different things. One guy came to us, I don't know, three or four years ago and said, these Countaches are maligned. They're really great cars. They're driver cars. And so why don't you come out to Denver and drive my cars? And we sent the writer out there. And like, <laughs> as soon as he walked in the door, the guy was like, okay, now we can't go over here because you don't want to drive the clutch. And all, yeah. he gave all these reasons. We're like, wait, we thought we were here to see these were driver cars. You ever try to back one of those in a parking spot before? Yeah, you see oh. how the Italians do it, right? They sit on the sill. Yeah, Isn't that the best? Hor- yeah. yeah, it's, it's horrible. I mean, they, but with backup cameras and stuff now, is yeah. that, that'd be the first thing I ever did if I had a Lamborghini. I, I would have a backup camera up front 100%. so I didn't drag the nose and in and, and, and the rear. They're hard. Uh, so I drove the one that was on our with, that we photographed last fall, and it was pouring rain. I drove it on Lime Rock. They're like physically hard cars to drive. Yeah. The steering's really heavy because they put, you know, they got wider tires and have power steering. The gear shift's heavy, like everything. I mean, that is like a. They're still great cars. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even though it's like, you know, they're still. Okay, I can't talk yet. I, 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 I know. Get it, no. I get it. All right, it, it, right. it is one of those things like, uh, so I'm into motorcycles. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've always leaned towards Honda and then the Kawasaki Green. I fell in love with that. And right. I, I, I lean towards the 600 class. Everyone's like, oh, you're too big for it. No, no, no. I lean towards the 600 class Money power. street bikes. I bought a Ducati, a 999 Superbike. God, those are I always beautiful. wanted one. Yeah. And, it, and it had the the Murcicello rims on it and all that. Loved Single sided swing arm? Uh, yeah. Oh, and and I, I, I love that bike. I bought it wrecked. It was laid down really, really nice or really, really light. Kicked up oil all over it. I bought it in the wintertime. I cleaned it up, painted it red because it's a Ducati. It's got to be red. Yeah. And I got that bike out, and I thought, like, I was, like, on top of the world. Wow. And then after driving it for a summer, I sold it, and I, I bought another 600 Kawasaki. Oh, really? And, and, I mean, yeah, everyone, oh, is that a Ducati? Oh, look at that. And it Because it's, like, the Ferrari of motorcycles. Okay, I'll send you a link. We did a piece on the Ninja and yeah. where that came from. Did you happen to see it? No, I it did was not. fascinating how Kawasaki came up with that because what a name! I love a ninja. Yeah, I, I, I do. And again, being a Honda guy growing up, it was yeah. hard for me to cross over. But they were cheaper, and that 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 green, I hated it at first. I, I was love like, it. When, and now, no, I love it. I'm yeah. I'm, I'm I'm in love with it, and I'm just and I, and uh, I actually just bought another Harley uh, a couple <laughs> days ago, but. I was like, well, Harley's not fast enough to get hurt on. That's these are the lies <laughs> we tell each other. Uh, so uh, besides your current job at Haggerty, you, yeah. can't, you can't say Haggerty. Sure. All right. What's the best job you've ever had? Uh, it's a tricky one because they all had their barbs, right? Uh, I'm going to say the road and track gig when I was running road and track because that title was so ingrained in, in, in what I – you know, my jam is really European sports cars and road racing. And yeah. that's really what that magazine and that title existed for. So thanks to that and the connections, you know, I was going to the Ferrari factory twice a year. Wow. I was driving all kinds of race cars. And it was just at that that apogee where I'd been around enough. People knew my reputation. They knew I could drive. I was suddenly getting in all these crazy race cars. And so I was just spending so much time behind the wheel. So that was yeah. that was super exciting. So driving a Ferrari is cool? Driving a Ferrari, I mean, I got a track and stuff. That's yeah, cool. I, I might it, have to put that in the bucket. The list. Um, they, they had a uh, a press junket for the La Ferrari, which is that hybrid thing, <laughs> yeah. and it's rear drive only. And and they they let us go around their test track there at Marinello. It's called Fiorano, and you know it's making close to a thousand horsepower with everything. And what happens is is um, 
you overdrive it. Yeah. And so in a couple of laps, the rear tires are toast. Yeah. And and now it's just drift. So you're just every quarter sideways. Here's the next one sideways. Yeah. And there's a little Italian test driver in the uh, passenger seat with me. And you think he's telling you to stop. No, he's just laughing. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Go, 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 go. I mean, it was so super they fun. they paid you to do this. They paid me to do they, it. So they gave you money, flew you to Italy. It's part of my and, job. And that, that's a tough job. That's so how, I mean. how do I get a job like that? <laughs> that took uh, 20 years, yeah. <laughs> So how about this? What's the worst job you ever had? Uh, that's pretty easy. The job that, that really kicked me into gear to uh, figure out something else was I was an engineer. I was working at a uh, garbage incinerator in Baltimore, Michigan, in Baltimore, Maryland in July. Mm. So you can imagine how that smelled. Yeah. And since I was the youngest, um, I had to go check this thing that uh, monitored the opacity of the exhaust coming out of the incinerator so how much ash was in it <laughs> and so i'm terrified of heights and i have to climb this exposed ladder up this smokestack and then walk around this catwalk to see this thing while the smell and the sweat is coming down and i'm thinking there was is this my life this game <laughs> so that was easily the worst job by the way i still kept the boots from that job it's like but i have them in my closet like yeah. it's the reminder like no matter how bad of a day i have i'm always like yeah, not that it's in rare. No, that, that is good to to keep that. Uh, all right. So, uh, what's your uh, what's your favorite car? And you can if you if and I'm not talking about a daily driver. If you could have one car sitting in your garage, you weren't buying it for money or anything like that, but purely just to own it, work on it, drive it, experience it. What do you think you would go with? Uh, it's a tough one. Yeah, I that's mean that's like your one. favorite your kid. kid. Yeah, I, exactly. I, it's like uh, I, I'm really into these. Uh, the Resto Mod 911s made by a company called Singer. Yeah. And uh, I think the guy who started that, Rob Dickinson, he's got this eye yeah. for, you know, he really makes the things look right. He's out east, right? Uh, no, he's in uh, L.A. L.A., okay. And then uh, they had this company called Ed Pink build this four-liter version of the air-cooled motor. Okay. And it makes like 400 horsepower, and it just rips. Yeah. And uh, so the the whole car, kind of like what I like to do is travel and do stuff. It just sort of fits that mold, and I think it looks really – it just – it looks right and you can, you know, customize it the way you want. So that's kind of, that's what's on my mind, but yeah. I, his favorite, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a foul. Yeah, you yeah. can't ask that question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what's yours? You like, Oh, I can't answer that. I yeah. mean, you know, I mean, I could maybe name a top 10 and then I'd change it tomorrow or whatever. You know? Yeah. That, I mean, cause you just said one. like, I really, really like a C7 Corvette. I'm into the Prius. <laughs> like the, you know, the first gen. I tell you what, you know, you can make fun of that car all you want. Oh, I will. <laughs> but that car, that was Toyota's moonshot. Yep. Have you ever seen the inside of that transmission? No, I have not. It is and I, unbelievable. And I hope I never have to. You know, it is so clever. Yeah. They've got a couple of electric motors. They've got drive motors, all this planetary thing. And it all syncs together and they stop this one and they get this one. It is it's like you want to see what like the human ingenuity can do. It's that freaking Prius. I mean, be honest with you, if we're talking about transmissions, you could take apart a Turbo 350 and lay it all out, and it's that amazing. looks like an engineering marvel to me. And it is. To watch it is people marvel. assemble that and yeah. get everything in there exactly. I'm like, yeah. yeah, I'm glad I don't have to rebuild. The transmissions is the one thing when I look at it, I'm like, wow. Yeah, but the Prius, you know, no matter what you I'm do, sure it's the next level. And no matter how you drive it in city highway, those things will get 45 miles to the gallon. They're, I mean, for gonna, for the job they're meant to do, they do it well. I'm in the smiles per gallon, sir. <laughs> I'm not. In, I don't know what this miles it. per gallon. I think I saw about. one in your driveway though when I pulled in. Uh, it's mine. I bought it. That's oh, you right. did? Well, no, that's just how I pick up chicks and stuff. You know, the Prius uh, in Ann Arbor. Of in Ann Arbor, no, yeah, yeah. no, no. That's David's uh, his commuter. We we tease him about. You can't that. argue with that yeah, car. He loves it. That's a great choice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He actually he does not love it, but it's it's good for his does daily. his job. Yeah. So uh, what about the worst car? What's the car that you personally, you know, despise or you don't like or you just don't get or whatever? Uh, hmm, don't get. Yeah. Like, don't get. Um, like, some people don't get, like, oh, I don't know why they drive these jacked up hillbilly trucks or these low riders. I don't get or, that. Okay, that's a good one. The yeah. really jacked up uh, heavy duty pickup trucks, I don't get at all. No. Yeah. Because they're just got to be terrible to drive. I don't think they're safe. And they put those big knobby tires. It's just solely not my jam. You know, and I just. But uh, I don't want to judge either. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I just had this breakthrough. Is uh, 
this summer. I'm gonna take you to your first mud bog, and you're gonna you're gonna change your whole world. You don't have to. I sent somebody because I saw the uh, redneck mud park in Florida, and yeah. I sent the writer to go cover it, and we got these incredible shots of these things in the air. You know, they build those big moving trolleys with all the kids in it. Yeah. I mean, going through the mud. I get it. It's just when not you, my thing. You see a truck with 44s or bigger shooting four rooster tails 50 feet or 100 <laughs> feet there it's just I, I get it i just don't think i feel like that's like why is that on the road <laughs> right well yeah yeah it, it probably shouldn't be on the road or whatever yeah uh so a couple other questions for you is uh you know we were talking earlier about evs and the, and i brought up how like the you know when the second generation of the Ford GT or the new, the 05 or 06, whenever they came out, that was a V8. But the newest one that came out, and I don't remember, 13 or whatever, that's a V6. Yeah. And it's like, wow, here's, you know, one of the greatest cars ever built, especially if you watch the Ford versus Ferrari movie lately. I watch it every Friday night. Yeah. And, you know, we got away from the V8, and even Jay Leno was like, yeah, no big deal. Do you think that this is like – the death of the V8 in in our lifetime? No. No? No. I mean, I think that that layout has a certain resonance and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, especially for trucks. Yeah. I mean, the the and it, and that that push rod and the displacement and that and the cost is sort of like this uh I don't know. It's sort of like this just right thing for a lot of vehicles. So, no, I, I think it'll be around for a long long time. And what is there like fifty five million small block Chevys out there? I mean, it's at least number. yeah, you know, just yeah. up. No, my, in my dad's uh, garage, we got <laughs> half got of those. A few, yeah. So if uh, by the way, it, I drove the uh, the V six twin turbo GT last fall. Yeah. Down at the uh, it was in near Tail of the Dragon in the roads down there. Yeah. And it was the guy who was the designer for Multimatic, and the guy named Larry Holt, really neat guy. He designed that car, and I'd never been in one like to really drive it, and I'll tell you, it really surprised me. Yeah. Because I was under the impression, well, once you get past the C7 level of performance, what is there? Yeah. Why would you even want it? <laughs> and this thing was like, I mean, it was like whole nother level. Yeah. Like it was, but it wasn't boring. Like some cars I've driven, I think like, well, the car's doing all the work, but this thing was just so incredibly fast and competent and responsive. And it felt, I mean, I was just, I walked away like what my impression was and what, how wrong I was yeah. was sort of like a reminder to be a little more open-minded. I haven't been in the V6 version, but when they came out with the old five one, uh, uh, I got to go for a test drive with the car before we cut up. Yeah. Oh, that's a cool car. <clears throat> and yeah. they had a, you know, professional Ford driver and yeah. stuff. And, you know, he's trying to like, Hey, you know, this is, you're going to feel it. And I'm like, look, you know, the G force. And I'm like, look, dude, this ain't my first rodeo or whatever. Sure. And I, I was recording it and I was just recording the speedometer and when you play the the video the video back, it sounds like a little girl laughing. Yeah, it's because amazing. that's how and it was me laughing. Yeah. That's how awesome it was. Yeah. It's just you know, and he went, you know, up to like 140 maybe. Yeah, fast and, car. And it was just a great. That car was a great experience. Yeah, you know, it's funny how your opinion of cars changes over time. Because I remember I was um, they had a prototype out at Gingerman Raceway, and this was when I was a car and driver, and I got to go out and uh, drive it for lap times, and it you know set all kinds of records it was really fast really easy to drive and i really thought you know remember i talked earlier about when a car is numb yeah like i don't get a good i can i can think and i say well i do this the car does that great but then there are other cars where it's like an instinctual thing and that car didn't have that sort of level of involvement yeah so i was like yeah whatever but now i i know people that so a lot of people around here that fix them and restore them and they work there like those engineers man they took that job seriously yeah like they they knew what they were building off of the GT40, and I mean, I wish I had bought one of those cars. I didn't have the money, but yeah. there's a reason they keep going up in value, even though they made four thousand. That is a really special automobile. And people don't get this: is that the passion and the brains and the engineering? That oh went yeah, behind something like this is they stayed up at night. They did worrying about a problem. How am I going to solve this? This we got to figure this out. And and what? And then they they would be taking a shower, and oh, it came to them, and I got to call them, even though it's six in the they morning, did. and let them, you know. And and people don't. And that's one of the cool things that we talked about with cars is I don't think people have that kind of passion in, in a lot of their careers. Yeah. It is, you know, I mean, yeah. the, the thing that we do is it's it's very exciting. I mean, it, it is a work. It's not all upside. There is a lot of downside to it, but there is passion. I mean, 
I, I've always had a problem sleeping in, at night and stuff, and I don't sleep that much, never have. I mean, that's been a huge advantage to me to working on cars and stuff. But, like, if my life's going wrong, I could stay up at night and worry about it. But if my life is going great, I'm staying up thinking about it. Like, thinking you know, it, yeah. it's a double-edged sword because so. I'm like, oh, I can't wait till tomorrow. We're going to paint that car or, yeah. or the transmission should be here or yeah. that new radiator. It's just funny how that, that works. Don't you love – this happens to me all the time. Like, since I'm a, a home-taught amateur mechanic and I'll be working on something and something won't work, whether, whatever it is. And I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll go to bed, and then and then I'll either wake up in the night or I'll wake up next morning, and suddenly I have some idea. Yeah. Like, oh, let me try this. And it works, yeah. And it's just like, you know, you just kind of need to get away from the problem a little bit, let it incubate in your brain a little bit, Absolutely. and often it comes. That, that is a great trick that I think a lot of young builders and, and mechanics and engineers need to realize is, you know, when I'm building a custom car, you know, we're working on all oh, the motor and the body work and the fab mm -hmm. and this. I mean, we could be working on nine different things. I mean, there's a, a an order you want to follow in. Sometimes sure. that reality happens. Of like, course. oh, the motor didn't show up at the rim. The, we don't have the wheel package. And so we'll be working on something and we can't figure it out. Yeah. And I'm like, and everyone's starting to waste time and get, you know, let's angry, this, swearing. Yeah. And I go, yeah. cool, let's just put it away and we'll go over here and work on it. Yeah. And everyone's, no, no, no. And I'm like, no, no, no. We're putting that away. Yeah. We're going to go over here. We just need to take a breath. And I said, you know, you could be taking a shower tomorrow or laying in bed tonight and we'll figure it out. We're smart. We'll figure it out. But you yeah. know what? Let's just, we got other things to do. Yeah. And, and like you said, is you just had that breakthrough. Like, oh. Sometimes it, 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 it's a great feeling, though. It is best. You also feel like, why didn't I think of that before? Am I dumb? <laughs> <laughs> of course we're dumb. Yeah. All right, I hate to wrap this up, but uh, our actually memory cards are, are starting to die, and the uh, the rescue cats they're, they're cats got to go out. Yeah, they want to they want to get petted and stuff. We'll definitely have Mr. Webster back uh, in a few future episode. There's so much stuff that we didn't get into, but obviously time is limited. But I really want to appreciate you for everything yeah, you did, sure. taking your time out of our day. Go check out Haggerty. If you're not familiar with Mr. Webster's work, I'm sure you can Google search him. It'll take you a whole two seconds to find article after article after article on him. Uh, as always, from, for David and I, thank you. And we'll see you guys in the next episode. Wow, you made it to the end of the video. Thank you so much. If you like what we're doing here, go ahead and click a like. You can follow us. In the future, we're going to release more videos all on automotive content, so look for us in the future. Thanks for watching.